since uh, originally I'm from Nizhny Novgorod, I'm supposed to uh, start with something uh, more uh, personal. And of course, uh, it's, it, it's obvious that uh, the news uh, about his death was uh, shocking for uh, all of uh, my friends and colleagues, and that was one of the most traumatic uh, experiences that I have ever uh, had in my, um, uh, in my life. But uh, there was a second uh, kind of shocking uh, experience which in fact triggered the whole idea uh, of this special issue. And it was my very brief conversation with a colleague of mine from, from Russia. And I was asking him, uh, and he, he was from Nizhny Novgorod, but I was asking him uh, what people in Nizhny think about the, the murder of Nemtsov. The answer was that it's only for you in Estonia that Nemtsov matters. We completely forget about him. We, we, we don't know who, 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 who he was. And of course, uh, that immediately made me, make me think that we, we, we should do something uh, to commemorate <coughs> this outstanding uh, person and uh, to kind of help or to contribute to inscribing his name into the contemporary uh, history of uh, Russia. And I think not only of Russia, because of course he left uh, political, uh, political traces in countries like Ukraine, uh, for example. And uh, uh, one of uh, my personal uh, experiences of uh, observing uh, how Nemtsov is uh, commemorated exactly one year after his, his murder came from uh, Stockholm when I have been on the 27th of February. If someone can help me with, uh, with this uh, picture, so uh, we have spontaneously gathered like uh, 30, 40 people from different, uh, different backgrounds. And what we did, we just decorated all uh, bridges in Stockholm with uh, this uh, uh, Nimtsov most. And uh, that was a kind of uh, very spontaneous, uh, you know, commemorative uh, action that, uh, you know, turns Stockholm into a city of, uh, of uh, commemoration. And I think it's uh, one of the interesting examples of, of how people, I mean, simple people, uh, either from Russia or from other countries, they do remember him, so they do commemorate and they do pay tribute to, uh, to his, um, uh, to his uh, contribution to Russian uh, democracy. Uh, not only in the city of Nizhny Novgorod, but on the federal level as well. Uh, coming back to his uh, uh, Nizhny Novgorod uh, experience at the start of his uh, career, a couple of names uh, that Bob has already mentioned, Hobart Viarde and Andre Maman, in fact, they were the first two scholars from the West, I mean, from the real West, one from the States, another from, from Amsterdam, from, from the Netherlands, who visited Nizhny Novgorod in the very beginning of 1990s when uh, Nemtsov was, uh, was the governor. And who kind of helped us, uh, I would say the first uh, post-Soviet generation of uh, uh, political scientists and uh, international relations experts in uh, widening our horizons and kind of connecting or reconnecting us to the international academic, um, academic milieu. Uh, and this brings me to a very important point, uh, which I think has a very clear political uh, political resonance. Uh, for me, the, the whole decade of 1990s was not kind of a time of troubles, which would be definitely part of the of the Putin's uh, Putin's perception and, and, and Putin's uh, characterization of 1990s. For me, it was a time of uh, opportunities. And I think it's uh, very important to inscribe uh, the name of Boris Nemtsov into this uh, decade that uh, gave uh, freedom to the whole generation of uh, uh, my, uh, my compatriots uh, in, um, uh, in Russia. Uh, in my uh, uh, presentation, which I will partly base on what I have written uh, in my authored uh, paper with uh, Alexander Yatsik, I will... Uh, refer to uh, his uh, uh, public discourse and his public campaigning uh, related to the Sochi Olympics, which in my view is one of the most interesting cases of uh, uh, public uh, uh, critique and raising the whole 
uh, set of issues related to uh, to this to this main event. But I will definitely also discuss some issues that stretch far beyond this uh, this event and that uh, uh, deal with uh, the, the, the the issues of sovereignty and uh, the nature of uh, Putin's rule in uh, in general. So. Two questions uh, will be uh, central for my analysis. One is uh, how can we speak about Nemtsov in more or less academic terms? Basically, the debate or the discourse about Nemtsov is very emotional. It's very much politically uh, politically driven. Uh, I remember uh, a colleague of mine uh, who immediately after his death said something like, uh, one fake macho killed a real one. And that betrays the whole, you know, emotional, uh, emotional, you know, background of uh, the debates of Nemtsov and uh, his uh, his life and his murder. My intention in this paper, our intention in this paper, was uh, to try to think about Nemtsov's contribution to the Russian political system and the Russian democracy in uh, more analytical and more uh, uh, academic perspective. Uh, which is not that often in uh, Russia so far, but I do think that uh, Nemtsov uh, can be remembered as someone who contributed to the evolution of Russian political system, and his contribution can be analyzed in, in academic uh, terms and from academic perspective. And the second question, which I would also like to briefly discuss, is uh, more related to kind of more contemporary uh, events and developments after his death. And I would like to uh, share with you some of my ideas of, on what would Nimtsov say about the most recent debate on sports and politics in uh, Russia, taking into account the first coming FIFA 2018 uh, World Cup and the, the, the whole story of corruption in, uh, in, this, in this institution. So why Sochi? What was uh, the driving uh, argument and why Sochi was, uh, in our view, important as an interesting case study uh, for uh, commemorating uh, political activity of Nemtsov. Well, first of all, there is a formal explanation. Nemtsov uh, uh, ran for mayor in Sochi when uh, the, 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 the Sochi was already uh, preparing uh, for hosting uh, the Olympics. And that's an important uh, kind of uh, element of his, uh, his political uh, uh, career. Uh, Secondly, uh, the Sochi Olympics is known, uh, widely known, not as a, just a celebration, not as just a, a mega event, uh, but also as a case for exorbitant corruption and mismanagement, uh, even uh, admitted by the president himself. So that's an interesting element of uh, the way how uh, Russia manages this uh, mega event uh, business. And uh, a third argument would be that uh, Sochi, uh, the, uh, the Sochi Olympics, uh, was expected to uh, kind of celebrate Russians of power. Uh, each second article about Sochi was uh, mostly uh, about expectations of uh, Russians of power uh, being the most important element of Russian, uh, of Russian diplomacy, Russian foreign policy. Uh, which, as seen from post-Sochi perspective, uh, looks a little bit questionable, because what we have after Sochi uh, was uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, economic sanctions, uh, many Russian officials on travel ban, uh, growing financial instability, financial troubles, uh, which are definitely and directly related to the military conflict uh, with uh, Ukraine. So we do have a this kind of rupture between this celebratory uh, narrative of uh, Sochi as something that would allegedly make Russia uh, a different country and uh, the harsh reality uh, on the ground. Uh, so I will start with some, uh, uh, some ideas that can be used for more or less academic analysis of uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov's uh, life and his contribution to uh, Political, political debate in Russia. And the starting point for our analysis is that uh, Nemtsov, uh, as a, a political leader, has to be uh, deployed, has to be placed in uh, a very, I would say, complicated uh, uh, political uh, uh, milieu 
uh, which would combine mainstream or the dominant discourse and the opposition uh, discourse, a non-mainstream discourse. And the role of Nimtsov, despite the fact that he was one of the uh, leaders of anti-Putin opposition, the role of Nimtsov in his positioning at this kind of intersection of, let's say, hegemonic and counter-hegemonic discourse was, uh, uh, I would say, precarious and uh, uh, even, uh, even shaky. So his legacy has to be analyzed uh, at the intersection of these of these two of these two discourses, on the one hand, yes, he was a leader of anti-Putin uh, opposition. But on on the other hand, and the case of uh, his uh, uh, his contribution to uh, debating the Sochi Olympics made it quite clear that he positioned himself as a very experienced regional uh, politician, uh, a governor in Nizhny Novgorod, and then a member of uh, the regional legisla uh, legislature in uh, Yaroslav Oblast. And as a foreign policy, as, as, a, as, a, as a federal policy maker, so he had a kind of double a double identity, which makes him a very interesting uh, interesting uh, object of uh, of academic research. Uh, one more interesting thing is was that Nemtsov was not against Social Olympics uh, in a general sense. He said that yes, we are in favor of hosting Social Olympics. But in the meantime, uh, he raised a number of uh, financial and economic issues that, uh, in my view, made his, uh, his claim about Social Olympics uh, explicitly political. Uh, nevertheless, if we take a closer look at uh, the structure of his discourse and on what he said about Social Olympics, uh, he never seriously touched uh, social issues related to the Social Olympics, like, for example, mass scale evictions or uh, issues of environmental protection that were not in his agenda for some reason. Uh, he was completely silent on something which was a matter of uh, a big debate uh, here in the West, including in the States, the issues of LGBT uh, community in Russia. He did not say a word about that. So his, his main focus was on uh, corruption, on mismanagement, and exorbitant price for this uh, two-week uh, celebration of uh, Russian uh, patriotism and Russian kind of great power narrative, Russian uh, come back to the club of uh, uh, great powers. And uh, that's what uh, we have uh, in, our, uh, in our article. We claim that uh, this, his anti-corruption uh, corruption campaign and his anti-corruption narrative is deeply uh, political. The question is why? Uh, what, what is political in his uh, in his campaigning? And there are there, there are at least two answers to this question. First of all, uh, uh, Nemtsov's narrative is political because he contested uh, one of the main pillars of uh, Putin's uh, discourse and Putin's system of rule, and this is about setting the criteria of inclusion and exclusion from the political community named Russia. And secondly, uh, Nimtsov uh, explicitly contested the rule by exception, claiming that the whole uh, Sochi Olympics is about a series of exceptions, which are just completely unacceptable for Russia. And these are two things which I would like to uh, uh, to briefly uh, of being the, the, the key source of uh, defining the rules of belonging to uh, uh, to the Russian political community by emotionally kind of articulating the idea of patriotism, the idea of, of nationalism, and uh, the, the loyalty to the state, which is directly related to these two, to these two ideas. Uh, for the Kremlin, uh, uh, and for Putin uh, personally, the Sochi Olympics was a kind of loyalty test. So if you are against Sochi Olympics, that means that you kind of detach yourself from this, this collective, uh, uh, collective uh, self of Russia. You kind of put yourself in a very precarious position of someone who criticizes uh, the most important event uh, for uh, for the whole country, and that was also part of the of, of the Kremlin's narrative, to kind of construct uh, uh, the the, the pro-Putin majority, and to differentiate this majority from uh, the minority of those who are uh, uh, labeled as uh, anti-patriotic, pro-Western opposition, the fifth column, etc. So it was a political a political war in the whole in the whole Sochi, uh, in, in the whole uh, Sochi interest. And again, this is about criteria of belonging to a uh, uh, political um, uh, community. Uh, 
in this regard, uh, the contribution of Nimtsov was enormous. Uh, he claimed that, in fact, you can be uh, a member of uh, this political community without, uh, you know, sharing the dominant, uh, the dominant attitudes, the dominant uh, narratives, uh, without sharing this pride for, uh, for the country. Uh, in fact, uh, what Nemtsov claimed that uh, uh, instead of uh, producing this, uh, you know, a celebratory uh, narrative of Russia coming back to the club of uh, 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 great powers, we need to speak about the shame for, uh, for, uh, for mismanagement and for exorbitant corruption. And I think this claim was, uh, was, was political. Uh, the second issue, which uh, I think I'm running out of time. No. Yeah. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, political issue is that Nimso was explicitly against uh, uh, the way how the Sochi uh, project was managed uh, was managed by uh, by the Kremlin claimed that uh, uh, the, uh, the the way how it was managed uh, was uh, constructed on the basis of uh, what might be called sovereign exceptions exceptions from the existing rules and he has a very long list of these exceptions which were legalized by putting himself uh, but this is an, a very interesting thing which uh, in fact. Uh, is reproduced in other uh, mega events in Russia, including the FIFA 2018 uh, World Cup. Uh, so, in fact, Putin, by his decrees, he discontinued uh, about a dozen of uh, federal laws because of Sochi Olympics. And this is what uh, Nimtsov raised and made it explicitly a part of the public debate, claiming that, uh, in fact, this is unacceptable for, uh, for democracies. Uh, so those extraordinary uh, instruments were heavily criticized uh, by him. And one of his strongest points was that it's not only about Sochi. Uh, all those exceptions uh, are about, uh, and, and this is not a deviation, all those exceptions are about legalizing a, a model of extra-legal governance that Putin's regime would be eager to reproduce in many other situations. So in fact, it was a kind of you know, warming up exercise for recycling or reproducing the same patterns of uh, governance in the different situations. And uh, I would say that uh, Nimsov was uh, completely right in claiming that, uh, yeah, in, in fact, uh, that's, uh, that's the case in many other, in many other situations, including in, in Moscow, including the cities that are preparing to host the uh, other, other mega events. Uh, now the second, uh, the second question which I would like to uh, discuss very briefly in the remaining minutes is what Nimtsov would say, uh, uh, should he be alive with us, about the most recent developments uh, in uh, this very interesting area related to sports and politics, especially in the anticipation of the FIFA 2018 World Cup and the scandal with uh, uh, corruption in uh, FIFA and other uh, interesting uh, uh, developments. But I will start with something that uh, connects the Social Olympics with annexation of Crimea. And Nemtsov was one of a few Russian uh, opinion makers who said that, in fact, the annexation of Crimea was planned during the Social, uh, the, the Social Olympics. So in this sense, he said there is no rupture between Sochi Olympic, I mean the whole logic of Sochi Olympics, and the logic of annexation, and the logic of uh, of, of supporting uh, military uh, insurgency in eastern Ukraine. For Nemtsov, that was just elements of one chain. He did not see a rupture between these two uh, these two things. And in this sense, he was very skeptical about uh, uh, discussing Sochi Olympics as uh, the manifestation of Russian soft power. He, he, was very, uh, he was very skeptical, sometimes very cynical about that. He said uh, on a couple of, of uh, occasions that uh, it's quite logical that after, uh, after Sochi, Russia annexed Crimea. That was, uh, that was one, uh, again, one uh, logical uh, uh, chain. And I would add to this one uh, kind of cultural argument. The Samso was not very strong in, in using cultural arguments. But I, I think the cultural arguments here are, are, are very important, and they would just uh, strengthen his uh, his uh, his uh, uh, his take on on that. 
if we take a closer look at the opening ceremony of Sochi Olympics, we'll see two very important things. We'll see that Russia position, openly positioned itself as empire. That uh, was very clearly stated in, uh, in, in the opening ceremony. And Russia position, uh, position itself as uh, kind of, you know, second edition of the Soviet Union. Because the story about Russia, the host of the Sochi Olympics, and it um, before uh, before Gorbachev, before Perestroika. Not a single word, not, not a single scene, but a single image about Russia as such. So Russia thinks about itself in Soviet in in, 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 in Soviet cultural terms, and that's what uh, what, what was not part of NEMSO of this course. But this is uh, this uh, can be added to, to, to this narrative <coughs> that might help us a little bit, uh, you know, to. Uh, uh, understand uh, the logic uh, behind uh, Russian policy in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, now, uh, concerning the most recent developments, uh, well, I, I think that uh, Nemtsov's take on uh, this important linkage between global institutions and authoritarian regimes is uh, very topical for today, because what we have with FIFA is uh, uh, definitely a story of uh, uh, a global sports institution, which is very fond of working with, uh, let's say, basically non-democratic regimes, and many of the FIFA officials made it, uh, made it clear. Uh, to some extent, and this is also uh, come back to uh, Nemtsov's, uh, one of Nemtsov's interview, he in fact say, said that uh, FIFA plays the same role in stabilizing uh, Putin's regime as the uh, International Olympic Committee did. And I think we need to take this, uh, uh, this uh, argument very, uh, very seriously. Uh, I would also say that uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, for Nemtsov, uh, the 2018 World Football Cup uh, could be harmful for uh, the economic viability and even the integrity of the whole country. Because Nemtsov predicted that Russia uh, can uh, face uh, uh, very strong uh, repercussions of uh, corrupt economy, he even compared Russia with Greece. And we do know that some economic troubles uh, in, in this country started with uh, mismanaged Olympic Games. So we, we do need to take into account these uh, this predictions, gloomy predictions of Nemtsov quite, uh, quite seriously. And I would also say that should he be alive, should he be with us, he would definitely make a strong case for uh, publicly debating uh, the whole model of sport management in uh, Russia with uh, rampant uh, doping scandals, which affects many sports uh, federations in Russia. And this is about not only about athletes, this is about uh, the policy of the state or the negligence of the state, because most of them, of this uh, sports federation, are directly uh, administered and run by uh, governmental officials. Uh, the financial and administrative crisis in uh, Russian football industry, in Russian basketball industry, that would only strengthen uh, Nemtsov's argument. And of course, I think that uh, he would claim that uh, the impact of economic sanctions on the future uh, developments in sports mega event industry is uh, very strong. And uh, we can hardly expect success, uh, success stories uh, from countries that are under economic sanctions. In this, in this respect. So what we miss uh, right now <coughs> is uh, voices of people like uh, Boris Nemtsov who, who would make the, the debate uh, on, uh, at least in, in this area of sports and politics, much more topical and uh, much more political in the sense that I have described.